I, here's an interesting question, David. In the presentation, you kind of pointed out how control of the whole process expanded um, in scope through each one of the paradigm shifts. And the companies were able to control more of their, their inputs and their impacts. Given that, is there some kind of parallel you can draw between the challenges of those transitions um, in the past, for instance, the quality movement and the transition we're going through? Well, I think so. It, it kind of goes back to this earlier question about, um, you know, what do I need to do to move on the path of sustainability? In each one of these shifts, the trick to the shift was kind of putting on a pair of glasses <clears throat> that allowed you to see something in the process that previously was hidden um, in terms of the efficiency or the use of resources or labor or expenditures in, as the, as in the process itself and how it operated. So each one of these three uh, areas, Taylor and uh, Merchant and Toyota, put on a set of glasses that allowed them to see something in the process that hadn't been seen before that had great value. It's almost like, you know, looking at the spectrum, you know, if you're in, infrared wouldn't have been discovered unless people actually could understand that there were frequencies in the infrared compared to just what we see in terms of visible light. So the last thing we're going to do here, at least in this next one, is we've got to put on a set of glasses that allows us to see things that are related to the impacts coming into our process or our product from upstream uh, suppliers and vendors based upon uh, impacts, uh, carbon footprint, uh, energy use, global warming, gas, materials risk, you know, availability of materials, water, other resources. And we've got to find a way to, first of all, minimize those impacts or minimize the sense to which they reduce the effectiveness of our manufacturing system or our product operations. And secondly, we've got to find a way to incorporate the cost of those things and the reuse or return of, of the product into our design cycle so that we essentially end up with a product and a process that minimizes the inclusion of these sort of so-called environmental externalities like we did in the, in the previous uh, several paradigms. So having the glasses, which are to some extent an analytical tool, some extent of, of, of understanding the impact and sort of the magnitude by looking at a different frequency as it were in the case of, of, of the vision uh, of, of, of uh, infrared, uh, having a sense to see things that were not obvious before, understand they have an important role, characterize what that role is extract or account for that characteristic and use that to make sure that we are meeting whatever regulations or meeting market demand or meeting requirements of the product as we as we do our manufacturing and our product development. So that's kind of a long-winded answer, but uh, that's kind of the way in which I would see this same kind of an opportunity that, that these other guys, Taylor, Merchant, uh, Toyota, and others envisioned when they made their jump forward. Well, that's a great point, David. To build off of that, um, we had a question here that says, what are the leading green manufacturing initiatives today in the automotive industry? And I, I would tack onto that um, since Ford and Toyota were both at the heart of previous paradigms, uh, how are they doing at making this shift? Well, um, <clears throat> it's a great question. So the interesting thing is the following. There are there's the product, right? So you have to look at uh, what Ford and Toyota, for example, are making and how the product responds to the c customer's needs in terms of the use phase. And then there's the manufacturing of it. So you know there's a tremendous amount of embedded energy and resources in manufacturing an automobile. So the way Ford and Toyota are responding to these kinds of things is to look at how they can, in fact, minimize the amount of embedded energy and resources in the manufacture of the product. And the way you do that is by applying some of the metrics and some of the procedures and processes that we've talked a little bit about here, um, about here today. But the, the big issue is, can you in fact um, think about that in the domain of the new market for automobiles? Uh, there's some very interesting things um, related to, and I, I put them on one of my earlier blogs, talking about what the car of the future is going to look like it's going to be half combustion, and maybe the other half is going to be alternate energy, hybrid batteries. Where it's going to be built, uh, not so much in Japan and the US, but probably China and India. Uh, what are the technologies going to be used to build those vehicles? Clearly, a hybrid vehicle is going to be built differently than a conventional internal combustion engine. 
vehicle. So I would hope and I would expect that companies like Ford and Toyota are using this reformatted or rejiggled uh, market uh, reality of what cars are going to be built, how they're going to be built in terms of materials and technologies that go under the hood, and where they're going to be built to refigure their manufacturing processes to take advantage of uh, these uh, uh, opportunities to determine how to minimize uh, waste and impact, how to green the process as they develop these new manufacturing technologies. Because then when you, you know, in, the, in Europe right now, when you buy a car, you look for a car, you can see what the grams of, of CO2 equivalent per kilometer are generated uh, in addition to the uh, uh, fuel consumption. You don't see that in the U.S. Customers are making decisions based upon how the, how the vehicle operates. Uh, and you're penalized if you buy a vehicle that has uh, lower than or higher than expected CO2 emission per unit of, of distance traveled in, in the European Union. So the manufacturer is looking at that and adjusting how they can increase the efficiency by manufacturing technology and design of the engine, and at the same time, how to minimize the environmental impact of that improved engine manufacturer so you hit both aspects of the performance of the vehicle in use and the manufacturing process while you're uh, creating that product to begin with. And I'm, I'm hopeful that both comp companies like Ford and Toyota and others will be using these opportunity and this sort of reshifting of the, uh, of the, of the market uh, to take advantage of that as we move forward. And the, and the, the, the things that I see so far is that, that they, are, they are responding. Uh, but they need these kind of metrics to tell how they're doing and to provide a long-term vision right, so they keep moving along on this path. That's our time for today. Thank you, David, for helping us look at the big picture of manufacturing. And um, you can learn more about David's insights by following his weekly blog, which is www.green-manufacturing.blogspot.com. And to learn more about the Laboratory for Manufacturing and Sustainability, visit www.lmas.berkeley.edu. Thank you to everyone for attending. We'll see you next time.